Welcome to Southern Salon Podcast. This is Amy, and this is the first episode in a new series that we're including in Southern Salon called the Talking Appalachian series. Talking Appalachian is a book that I co-edited and co-authored in 2014, and we have a Facebook page if you want to follow that called Talking Appalachian. We have over 3,000 people following that page, and we just share interesting information about Appalachia and the speech patterns of Appalachia, some of the things that we say and the way that we say them and why we say them. It's just interesting for people from the northern, central, and southern region to share similarities and differences in the way that we say things and why we say things. And there's a lot of cultural significance in that. So part of what this series is about as well is including authors who write characters in their books that either speak the dialects or characters who are affected by the way people respond to their dialects. And Silas House is the first one in this episode, and I met Silas many years ago at a book signing and read all of his books. Lee Smith had blurbed him, and so I trusted Lee Smith, (laughs) and that's why I picked up his first book. And he's just a magnificent writer. We grew up around the same time in central Appalachia. He's from eastern Kentucky, and I'm from southwest Virginia, so I relate to a lot of the things that he writes about. But he's a good, good person and a magnificent writer, and I urge you to pick up one of his novels or all of them this summer and just treat yourself to some some excellent literary work. Just a little bit of context, you're going to hear me reference the pandemic. These interviews were done in the spring of 2021, so we were coming at the end of the academic year with the pandemic. Um, and so this was part of a campus-wide event that um, I coordinated with our multicultural center at UVA's College at Wise, so I thank them. The dialects or characters who are affected by the way people respond to their dialects for giving me these audio files that I can then share with you of these interviews. So hope you enjoy. Welcome, Silas. It's really good to have you. I'm just going to tell our attendees a little bit about your work. Silas House was born in Lilly, Kentucky. He has written six novels and three plays. He has edited, co-edited, or co-authored several works of nonfiction. He's been published in the New York Times, Oxford American, CNN, NPR, Salon, and that's just a few. Widely published widely anthologized. And and Silas has won too many awards to name here. So he's gotten a lot of awards and recognition for his work over the years. Let me name his novels. And I have a few of them here. I have all of them, but you know, you loan them out to people and they don't give them back. So his first novel was Clay's Quilt. And this was published 20 years ago. So you've celebrated an anniversary, beautiful work, followed by Parchment of Leaves and The Cold Tattoo, which is a trilogy. And then Eli the Good, one of my favorites, young adult novel, beautiful book. Same Sun Here, which was co-authored with Neela Vaswani. And Southernmost, which I have, but I loaned out. But it has a beautiful cover, beautiful story, most recent novel. Three plays, The Hurting Part, Long Time Traveling, and This Is My Heart for You. Silas has taught at Eastern Kentucky University, Lincoln Memorial University, where he founded the Mountain Heritage Literary Festival, which I've attended many summers. And he's on faculty at Spalding University's MFA and MFA program. He's now the NEH Chair in Appalachian Studies at Berea College, where he's been since 2010. Welcome, Silas House. Thank you. Always good to see you, Amy. I just wish we were together. I know. I know. It's good to see you too. It's been a it's been an interesting year. It's been a rough year. So what's this year, this pandemic year been like for you as a writer? It's been a really productive year for me. I have always written better under stress. When I'm in trouble, I write better because that's how I always write myself out of troubled feelings, you know. I pour everything into the writing. Unfortunately, you know, it, it was a stressful year. But also, it was a year of stillness and quiet, and and that has always really helped me. You know, I've just we've been home for a year, and we've been going for lots of walks and spending lots of time with the dogs. And walking is always the way to writing to me too. 
anything I write is preceded by walking. And I certainly did a lot of that over this past year. So I did, I finished a book at the very beginning of the pandemic and um, sold that to Algonquin. That'll be out in uh, fall of 22. And then I just completed another short novel that I'm really happy about that I'm, I'm still revising. My problem has always been that I have too many ideas and not enough time. I had a lot, I had a little more time during the pandemic. So it worked out for me. That's great. I can't wait to read your new novel. So are you going to read from that novel tonight? No, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm, I'm still too <laughs> trepidatious. I was I was going to read a little bit from my uh, essay that I wrote for you for your book, uh, Talking Appalachian, which is such a great book. Thank you. So I'm always glad to talk about it. Well, let's just dive in and talk about dialect first, then. Let's just talk about voice. And, you know, we had Georgella last week or two weeks ago, actually, and, and we talked about voice place and what voice mm-hmm. place means. For people who are joining us who may not be familiar with dialect and dialect terminology. So we'll, we'll talk about three aspects of it. You know, there's the vocabulary that we use, like when we say soup beans instead of pinto beans. There's the, the grammar patterns that we use, particularly in our moments where we might just be sitting on the front porch with our grandmother. You know, I don't, I don't want to sound like Dr. Amy Clark, so you may not hear standard grammar from me in those moments, right? And then there's what we refer to as accent, which is the phonology or the sound, the way that we pronounce our words. And that's really the most telling part of how we sound. And when people recognize us for who we are, it's usually in the accent. So you have taught at lots of universities and you've traveled the world and you've been in academia now for a while and you still have retained your accent. So can you talk about that? Because it's it's something that's it's very easy to lose, particularly when you're in the English field or you're in the field right. of, of writing. Yeah, and for, I always want to start off by saying that when I talk about this, I'm never... I never mean to criticize people who have lost their accents. That's a real complicated thing that has lots of reasons. It just so happened that for me, it was sort of drilled into me by my family that that was, I was raised in a, a family of, uh, that came from deep poverty. By the time I was a child, we were lower middle class, but my parents had lived, you know, through the kind of poverty that Hollywood thinks everybody in Appalachia lives in. And they were really adamant that the one thing that we really had was our culture and that we shouldn't let anybody take that from us. And a lot of that came from my parents having moved very briefly up north like a lot of Appalachians did in the 1960s in one of the Great Migrations and really being the subjects of of great scorn. I talk about that a little bit in my essay. And instead of it making them ashamed, it made them defiant. And so they gave that to me, that defiance to me. From a really young age, I was very aware of grammar, and I really value good grammar. And I have a lot of students who will come to me where I teach and say that, you know, people are giving them a hard time about their Appalachian speech. And when we get really talking about it, what they're being given a hard time about is not their grammar, but it's about the way they pronounce things. And that is really problematic because there's nothing wrong with pronouncing things in a particular way based on the world that you grew up in and the culture you grew up in. I always tell them, you know, for me, it's really important to speak in proper grammar. And for you as my student, I want you to be grammatically correct. But that has nothing to do with the way you pronounce words or colloquialisms you use, even to some degree, your syntax and things like that. And I think people get real confused about that. The other thing that really troubles me is that I know that I speak grammatically correct. I know that I do. Yet I will have people tell me, people from who are not from the area, they will correct me on things. Like I told somebody the other day, I said, well, join, uh, join Amy and me. We're going to be talking about dialect. And this is just an example, right? This would happen pretty often. And they would say, it's actually Amy and I. And I'd be, no, it's not. It would be join Amy and me. And, you know, people think because they are from some certain place or they went to some certain school that they automatically know their grammar better than I do because I'm working class Appalachian who went to a state school, <laughs> you know, and that it's deeply rooted in classism. 
it's real close to racism. And those two things are forever linked. Often when I tell people that, you'll see a sort of uh, fear go into their eyes where, the, where they feel like, oh, I'm, I'm being called out here. And I think it's important to let people, a lot of times people just don't understand the complications of that. The reason people find it so easy, the, the reason they feel so free, I think, to correct somebody who speaks like me is because when they hear my accent, they hear poverty. Now, lots of people from lots of different class backgrounds speak the way I do. It, it's not about class. It's about place, right? But media for a hundred, over a hundred years, and when I say media, I mostly mean film, television, comic strips, cartoons, big time, advertisements, have taught people that there is a connection between a particular kind of accent and class. They've also taught them that there's a connection to um, backwardness, especially if you see a character in a movie and, and they want to quickly introduce that character as racist or homophobic or something, they'll assign them a Southern accent or an, or an Appalachian accent. So, and that, I mean, and that I, also happens with other accents as well, right? If you want a yeah. tough guy, they're fr- they've got a New York. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. It's shorthand. It's it's film shorthand. And, you know, I mean, and sometimes people say, oh, you know, nobody thinks that much about that. And, and lots of times it's used for comedy and comedy has exemptions to some degree. But when your whole entire life, if you're not, if you have no exposure to real Appalachian people and your whole entire life, you're told, oh, these people are stupid because they speak this way. These people are lazy because they speak this way or whatever. Eventually that takes up residence in you. And then the reverse is true in that I have a lot of students who will tell me, you know, I'm ashamed of the way I talk because, because people think I'm stupid and they think that I'm that my family's lazy and that, that we're illiterate. And so they want to change the way they speak. And so, although it may appear to be innocent when you just look at it and, you know, happening every once in a while, it has real ramifications on the psyche. And I just think that you shouldn't, I, I would never want to instill shame in somebody. Why would anybody want to hurt somebody else that way? So we should be aware of these things. Well, and that's what your essay speaks to so beautifully. Is this a good time to read it? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just read the first couple of pages, and then maybe I'll read a little more later if we have time. So this is from the very beginning. I am 12, the teacher's pet. I often get to lead the class in the Pledge of Allegiance. I am the first call done when I put up my hand. I have been personally selected by Mrs. Black to write the class play about FDR. But today, Mrs. Black is absent, and we have a substitute, Sour sullen, angry for no good reason, although in retrospect, I think it may have been because of her green, all polyester dress suit that looked like the fabric of my granny's couch. Mrs. Black is always happy and excited about learning. This substitute teacher does not want to be here. Plus, she is from off. Off is anywhere but here, and we hear people talk about it all the time. Oh, that preacher don't know what he's talking about. He's from off. Or she moved off and completely changed. Think she's better than everybody now. The substitute stands at the blackboard and slaps a ruler against her hand. Her cat's eye glasses look like something a teacher would wear on the Andy Griffith show. Well, does anyone know the answer? We are studying caves. The question she has asked is why people shouldn't touch cave walls when they are spelunking. We all know the answer because Mrs. Black gave a good presentation on it yesterday, making spelunking my new favorite word, which I have been trying to work into a sentence naturally ever since. But this woman is too hateful, and no one wants to cooperate with her. Daryl Carr does a bird call, hooty-hoo, and everybody laughs. The miserable woman's brows arching together. Have you kids not learned anything about caves? I raise my hand as I can't stand the silence stretching out across our classroom and because I don't want her to think we're stupid. Yes, she nods to me, more exasperated than glad that I'm willing to answer. You shouldn't touch cave walls because the oil from your finger could stop a stalactite from growing. 
the substitute looks like she might laugh, then she looks mad again. Your answer is correct, but if you want people to take you seriously, you must stop talking like a hillbilly. I have been taught this word is acceptable only when another hillbilly is using it. The woman is not my people. It's oil, she enunciates, not oil, and it's finger, not finger. That's the way I talk, I counter, sitting up straighter in my desk, defiant. You talk wrong, she mimics and laughs to herself. The whole class is silent. No one is laughing with her. And the shame rushing over me isn't because she's embarrassed me in front of my classmates. To them, she's only embarrassed herself. But because I know that really, she's making fun of my people. And so I think that's what it's always about to me. It, it never feels so much like an attack on me somehow. I don't quite know how to explain it, but it's like my parents' faces come out in front of me and my aunts and my grandparents, and I just feel like they're being negated. And, and one reason is because I know that their accents were so much thicker than mine. You know, I know that mine is just, especially when I'm speaking, like right now when I'm talking to you, I'm not, it's not that I'm trying to talk differently, but over the years I have learned that I have to enunciate a little more or I'll lose half my audience. So if I was talking to my parents or anybody in my family or community, my native community, I would be talking a little bit differently. But at the same time, even in that situation, I wouldn't be talking as thickly as my parents or as my grandparents because I think each generation, it's been taken from us a little bit as we assimilate a little bit more, as we are exposed to more media, uh, audio media, you know, and just things like that. We call that leveling in sociolinguistics when it begins to, features yes. begin to die out. We, we, yeah, and that happens. It does happen. Like, the, you know, you're right, because if I go home, my husband isn't from Appalachia. He's from Richmond, Virginia. And so he's pretty aware of, he can detect the slightest change in the way that I speak. <laughs> yeah. He says when I go home, it's very, very different because I'm around right. my family and they, and, and they do, particularly my grandmother, and they do sound very different. You know, one of the, and that's such a powerful essay. And I have, back when I was reading more from Talking Appalachian, that was always the, the excerpt that I read from. And I mean, I've seen people cry as I'm, maybe you have too. And I think, you know, sometimes the teacher in us too, those of us that are teachers, you think, you know, have I ever done that? And not, <laughs> not to that extent. I mean, sure. I know I've never tried to be mean to anyone, but have I ever made someone, have I ever made someone feel like they were devalued, you know, mm-hmm. in, in, in the way that I taught them. And so it's such a power. And, and the fact that, that stayed with you well into adulthood. Mm. And, and there's more to that story, which you're probably going to read later. There's way more to that story. And OIL comes back. Mm. So one of the themes that in part two of Talking Appalachian with people who, who wrote for that particular part, which was what it means to be a speaker, a, a native speaker of Appalachian dialects, is the there comes a point where they sort of have a, a crisis about it. You know, even George Ella wrote, wrote about that in voice place. And, and Lee Smith has said this, you have to go somewhere else to get some culture, right? Mm. <laughs> because we don't recognize that it's, it's who we are yes. in the moment. And then you come back to it. There's, there's a pivotal point. Crystal Wilkinson writes about this. There's a pivotal point where you come back to it and you begin to own it. Did that happen for you? I, I don't really remember having I mean I've I've certainly heard lots of people talk about that I just think it had been so drilled into me that was such a thing of my family however when I first when my first book was published and I had to go on book tour I was terrified that I would I would stand up to read and half the audience would get up and leave and I began to really obsess about it and Lee Smith, who has been a mentor to Amy and both of us and lots of people, uh, a great writer from Southwest Virginia. I was with her at a writing conference, and I told her how scared I was of that. And um, she said, well, honey, just be yourself, and if they don't like it, just, that's just tough, you know, just too bad. And somehow, I mean, it was just such a common sense response, but it 
But it was also a very Appalachian response, you know, and it just freed me to think, well, that's exactly what my family's been saying the whole time. You know, if, if somebody doesn't like it, they're too bad. You know, I, I'm, I'm not I'm not doing anything incorrect and I'm just being who I am. And and in a way, I'm preserving something of my family that might be lost otherwise, because like I said, it is less in me. I don't think I ever consciously set out to preserve it or anything, but as a writer and somebody who's in the literary world and in the academic world, I'm definitely more aware of it. I think about it all the time. And a lot of it I think about because my students talk to me about it. I know it's an issue for them and I want to be somebody for them to, to point to or to come to, you know? Right. So we did, we have one question in the Q and a about the difference in Northern and Southern accents. And, and that's a good question because Appalachia is such a long region. There is no one way of speaking. I mean, if you think about Pittsburgh, which is in Appalachia, there's Pittsburghese, which is, you know, there are some, you'll hear people say Warsh in Pittsburgh, just like you'll hear them say it here, but they have different vocabulary for things. They have different pronunciations for words. And so along to answer, to answer that question, along the Appalachian corridor, there are literally hundreds of dialect variations, right? From Western Pennsylvania down to um, West Virginia, to central to southern, what we aren't is we're not deep south. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a very different yes. thing. And I think you you changed my mind. Now this is this is a hot topic right here. You changed my mind about Appalachia versus Appalachia. Uh-huh. So I used to be one of those people that that Appalachia is absolutely wrong. It's absolutely mm-hmm. wrong. And I can you can you speak to that because it really it caused me to to shift the way that I think. Well, the way I think about it is a lot of people do get really forceful and say, you know, and in, they'll really insult people who say Appalachia, Appalachia. I can't even hardly say it the other way, but, <laughs> um, but some people do get really angry about it. And I'm, my response is, you know, if that's the way people in Western Maryland say it, then what's wrong with that boat? The word is beautiful. No matter what, it looks beautiful. It, it sounds beautiful. It just happens to be pronounced Appalachia where I'm from. I mean, it's like, I, I grew up between two towns. One was Oneida, Tennessee, and one was Oneida. No, one was Oneida, Kentucky, and one was Oneida, Tennessee. Nobody ever thought a thing about that. They were spelled exactly the same way, but just because of that, I don't know, 80 miles between them, there was different pronunciations. So what, you know, so I don't like for people to correct me on something like that. If that's the way I've pronounced it all my life and lots of people around me have. So why would I do the same thing to somebody who says Appalachia? It doesn't sound right to me, but that's because, you know, you, you hear something, you, you're told all your life that one plus one equals two. Well, you think that all your life, right? But, that doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong for somebody to pronounce it differently. Right. And we've got somebody in the chat that that's talking about her grandmother from P- near Pittsburgh who would say yens instead mm-hmm. of ewens and and they pre- and we pronounced it Appalachia. So and that's right. that's the key point particularly if someone identifies as Appalachian and they're they're saying Appalachian exactly. that's how they were raised to say it. But now we've got a question, but what about correcting people who aren't from the region and who are using it that way? Well, I think the key word is correcting. You know, I would, I would, if somebody said that to me and they were talking, I would never stop them and say, well, actually we pronounce it this way. I would only, you know, I would only volunteer that if they asked me, you know, how do you feel about that? And then I would say, well, my, my preferred pronunciation is Appalachia. It just feels Mm -hmm. more correct. And, and as I understand it, it is closer to the root word, which is comes from Appalachie, right? the, which was right. the Soto's group brought that word up from Florida. Actually, it was a, a Native American tribe in Florida, but they sort of put Appalachie over the whole south, but it happened to be over the mountains. You know, it was one of those map-making things, and that's how we became Appalachia. Mm-hmm. Isn't that right? Is that the yeah, word? and I think... 
I may be mistaken, but I think it actually means sea, and they they yes. got confused and right. put it on the mountains instead exactly. of the ocean. Yeah. So. So yeah. I mean, that's why language is endlessly fascinating. You know, little things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I just think that. I think there are a lot more important things for us to worry about in Appalachia. <laughs> <laughs> there are, that's for sure. But I'm so glad that we talked about that because, mm -hmm. you know, I always, I always come back to, to, to what you said. And I think you used um, Patricia Berg as an example. I think you, I think I heard you say one time that she mm -hmm. grew up using, or she always heard that. And that's the way that she always pronounced it. And Yes. I mean, we've got people in the chat right now saying they're from Appalachia and they use the long A and thank right. you for yeah. <laughs> for finally saying that it's okay. Right. Um, but you'll still get people that will say, I, 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 I'm I, sorry, I can't accept it. Well, no people, will, people will fight you over. Yeah, they will fight you over. <laughs> it's interesting to me. That's, that's such an interesting aspect of language. Mm -hmm. It's what we talk about so much in my class is why does it invoke such you know, passion in people. Yeah. And, and that's because we attach such strong emotion to the way things are pronounced because of memories, yes. because of connections to our culture, because of connections to people. And, you know, that reminds me, if I can, I'll try to tease this out as complexly as I can, and but briefly. I was talking about all of this one time at, a, at an event, and this woman stood up, and she had a very thick New, New Jersey accent which I couldn't have identified, but she identified it for me, told me what it was. And she said, you know, I'm negated just as much based on my accent as you are, yet you all talk about it all the time. And I understand what she's saying. However, I think when you're talking about an Appalachian accent, it goes so much deeper class-wise, and there are so many more stereotypes attached to it that just about anybody can name off. I mean, I can't... I don't really know anything about the culture of New Jersey enough to make any kind of judgment calls about an accent and all that, you know, but I think a lot of people around the United States could hear an Ac Appalachian accent and they there's been so much media that they have assumptions and so much of it is class. It's, it's all about class, of course. And I think that that has been used against us when you look at the history of the way corporations have taken advantage of the region, you know, and just things like that. I was, I'm glancing over here at the questions. This might be a good time to read another part of your essay okay. because we had this question. Can you give advice for people who are being told they speak wrong or weird and how to let people know the critic that criticism is hurtful? So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. part I of your it all essay, the time. Like, yeah, <laughs> we do. It's like, where do we start? I don't know if I can get to that part of the essay. So if oh, we'll just read. We'll just read what you. I'm just. I'm going to read this little part about my parents to sort okay. of pick back up on why I always think of my people, and then I'll go back to that. Okay. And try to answer that. My parents left the mountains briefly in the late '60s to find work. There was nothing for us back home except for me to work in the mines or at some gas station, and for your mother to be a waitress. My father explains. So they went north. Two of my paternal uncles had already settled in Hamilton, Ohio, another one to Michigan, and one of my mother's sisters had recently moved to Dayton. They sent back news of good-paying jobs. On their visits home, my aunts chattered about the big department stores and how the schools were so much better and how they had washer-dryer sets up north, while my uncles bragged about bars being on every corner and their newfound ability to own Corvettes. To hear them tell it, it was the promised land. My parents ventured to Flint, Michigan, where they rented a trailer in a little Appalachia trailer park and immediately found jobs with good wages. My father poured concrete on the Flint River Flood Control Project while my mother built refrigerators at the Gibson plant. My father didn't have trouble up north. He'd had his fair share of discrimination in the Army, where boys who taught like him were singled out as stupid hillbillies. Once, at Fort Hood, Texas, during an alert in the middle of the night, my father had struggled to get his shoes on due to being half-drunk and sleepy-eyed. A fellow soldier laughed at him. What's wrong, hillbilly? Not used to putting on shoes? My father, remembering how hard his mother had worked to raise him, and his eight siblings alone after my grandfather died, 
rose up with fists flying. He and the man had fought all over the barracks. Perhaps once he got north, he didn't even hear the put-downs anymore. Or maybe the country-come-to-town gleam was not as bright on him as on my mother. That rural glimmer was only one of the things that shone out from her. She had a natural ability to make friends. She impressed them with her wild tales of having been a driver in the Manchester drag races and with her singing prowess. Before long, everyone was gathered around her during lunch, demanding Loretta Lynn and Brenda Lee songs. I couldn't eat my lunch for them wanting me to sing, she says now. She was surprised that Northerners loved country music so much, but eventually she realized that they were making fun of her, too. The lunchtime group crowded around her while they ate exotic dishes like goulash and mushroom sandwiches. My mother preferred bologna or cans of viney sausages, viennese in eastern Kentucky parlance. And after she sang for them, they asked for another kind of performance. This one girl said she had to watch my mouth when I talked because she couldn't understand what I was saying, my mother tells me, reenacting the way the woman stared at her lips. They'd make me say stuff like, a lunum a fall, and just die laughing, she says. I picture the factory workers inching closer, all at the same time as if choreographed, studying my mother as if she is a late 60s version of Gertie Neville's. What's that shiny stuff you wrap up leftovers in, one said around the cigarette in her mouth, elbowing a co-worker. At the time, she smiled and sometimes laughed along with them, but in retrospect, she wishes she hadn't. I just wanted to get along and be accepted, my mother says now, not meeting my eyes. Sometimes it made me feel bad, though. I felt like they thought I was dumb just because of the way I pronounced things. In my family back home, we had always called it lumium fall. But after they asked me a couple times, I finally learned to pronounce it their way, to not let them win, to not give them what they wanted. At home, though, I said it my own way. My mother had learned to pass. But she knew that there was a way of winning, too. She didn't have to fist fight the way my father had. She could defeat them quietly, one word at a time. My parents moved back to eastern Kentucky after a couple years. When I pressed them on why they return, they are evasive. We just missed home too bad, is the standard answer. But I wonder if there was something to the constant attention to their speech that made them miss home worse. Often I picture them driving back home, breathing a sigh of relief once they came to that place on Highway 25, where the mountains were laying out before them, once they found the curves in the road again, once they could close their eyes and breathe in the scent of kudzu or honeysuckle, once they could sit in the middle of a room and be surrounded by people who talked just like them. I mean, it's uh, interesting to think about that because I have been in that same situation, but I get so much more emotional when I think about them in that situation. And people ask me all the time, why are you so proud to be from Appalachia? And it took me a long time to figure that out. Like I was probably a year into my first book tour and had been asked that a hundred times before I understood. And I finally understood that I think the reason that I'm so proud to be from Appalachia is because when you constantly have to defend the place you're from, it makes you, it makes you more aware of what you love about it. It makes you proud of it. So I think that goes back to that pronunciation thing, right, of Appalachia. There's a ownership there to some degree. And we're so used to, it, it feels like that there's so little that is ours. Even if you look at television over the last 25 years, we're, we're not there. You know, I mean, rural people might show up very occasionally but I don't see a representation of myself in the media. I, I really don't. The closest I, that I, you could get to a complex portrayal of rural people, I think, would be Friday Night Lights, you know? And that's set in Texas. But there hasn't been a really complex portrayal of Appalachian people in a long time on television. <clears throat> there are some examples from the movies. And, I, I mean, I hate to bring that up as, like, the touchstone but that's, we're a visual culture. That's where most people get their information is from that sort of thing, you know. And so it informs them about who we are.
Yes. And let's see, do you find criticism between Appalachians, Kentucky versus West Virginia or Tennessee versus Southwest Virginia? Appalachians criticizing Appalachians. I haven't experienced that as much as I've experienced it within Kentucky itself. Like there's, there are some sections of Kentucky of Eastern Kentucky that think they are the only place that Appalachia actually exists. (laughs) That drives me crazy. I won't name the actual, there's one place in particular where everybody there thinks this is the only place that's really Appalachia. Um, So I don't know why that is either, but I think it goes back to just pride and pride of place and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And as far as dialect goes, yes, I I think the same thing happens um, in the way that people talk about pronunciations. Brent says, thank you, Silas, for your wonderful writing and appearing on this program and mentions a documentary from a native of Pike County named Ashley York. Yes. I was uh, one of the subjects and the executive producer of a film called Hillbilly. Mm -hmm. You can watch it on Hulu. It started out being about media representation of Appalachian people, rural working class people. And it still is about that, but it also involves the 2016 election because once again, over and over and over, rural people were being held up in this real generalized way, and especially Appalachian people. And I wanted to go back real quickly, Amy, to what you said about um, many different kinds of accents. You know, I mean, it's it's not even from city to city or county to county. It can be from holler to holler, right? And so it made me think about how one thing I always remind people is there is no monolith. You know, there is no monolithic Appalachia. There are many Appalachians. There are many different foodways. One thing that is really special to where I'm from that we consider a source of great community, and it's something that we, um, a lot of us have in common and talk about, is the love for pickle bologna. But if you get down in like Western North Carolina, and I don't even know if Southwest Virginia that's a thing, but I, I don't eat it. But it doesn't mean it's not a thing. <laughs> I don't like. And, much pickled anything. Right. But. And so like in West Virginia, the big thing is pepperoni rolls, you know, which mm-hmm. they the miners popularized. And so, I mean, each part of Appalachia has its own food ways, its own uh, way of speaking, its own culture. And I mean, there may be similarities, but I just think it's important to, to point out there's no particular way to be Appalachian. And lots of times people will say to me, you have such an Appalachian accent. And I always say, well, there are many, there are many, you know, this is not the only one. Right. I mean, there, and and we're getting so many questions. How, how do you handle it? How do you deal with it? How do you respond? And I mean, I respond and, and that's why, you know, I teach this class. I, I work a lot with teachers and it's a paradigm shift for people because, you know, when you have been told from kindergarten forward that, you know, there's a binary in language and there's a right way and a wrong way. And we fall into the wrong side. That's a very hard mindset to change. Even if you're a proud Appalachian, that's a very hard mindset to change, especially as a teacher, because it's, it's confusing and it's complicated. Mm -hmm. But I really think educating yourself about why, you know, Linda Scott DeRosier has a quote that I love. She says, I carry my heritage in my mouth. Mm Mm-hmm. I love that quote, and I use it all the time, just like I use uh, Georgella's word, voice place. I think people respond. I think people have such a knee-jerk reaction for all the reasons we talked about in the media and so forth, and classism and so forth. But I think a lot of it is ignorance. Yes. If you don't know that our dialect variations come from migration patterns and, you know, they go back centuries. I mean, there are features like Linda Scott DeRosier says that we carry in our mouths that go all the way back to the the days of old English. It doesn't mean we speak old English, but it, you know, we still have holdovers and that's due to migration. I mean, there's so many sociocultural factors Yes. that the, the the bottom line is it's not random. It's not broken. It's not a failed attempt at standard English. It is a rule governed code governed language with lots of variation. And that's why we had such a hard time with the title of the book. You know, we, we tried to call it Appalachian English and the critics came back and said, Nope, Nope, because there isn't one Appalachian English, you know, and then we tried Appalachian Englishes and they said, well, that'll be confusing. And so we ended up talking Appalachian. That's perfect. 
but, but, you know, no matter, they're still, you know, it's still problematic because it's, it's really hard to pin down what you do call something so complex, yeah. right? With so many layers, mm-hmm. but I really, I, that's my answer to the questions is, I mean, on one hand, there are some people you're never going to change. You're never going to change your mind. I mean, I have had so much eye rolling and head shaking yep. in some workshops. I'm <clears> like, no, I'm never, I, I can't do this. It's just like some people will never be able to say Appalachia. Right. Um, or, <laughs> Or accept it. And that's fine. That's it's the fine. same way that I cannot naturally say oil. I mean, my mouth, It. if I say that in a sentence, I have to pause before and after the word. It's just not natural for my, what is that called when your mouth is, uh, isn't there something in uh, dialect that it feels like your mouth is moving the wrong way sometimes. Uh, there's a certain way we hold our mouths, I think. Right as speakers from certain places. Yes. But anyway, to answer that question a little bit, for me, it's a case by case basis, how to handle it. For me, I, I think it's real easy to, to understand when somebody's being a smart aleck, when somebody's being malicious. And it is very rare that people are doing that. Most of the time, it is just a place of real ignorance that they just don't know that they're being insulting. I think the thing that bothers me more than anything is when people repeat back something to me the way the teacher did in that in that essay when she says um, when she says something like "You talk wrong," you know that really burns me up. And I sh- and when somebody does that, I'm like, "All right, all bets are off," and I will just say, "You know, that's really rude to." to mimic somebody to their face. I just, I, I, my diplomacy has gone when they do that. And I mean, that hasn't happened too much, but it's happened more than you would, than I, I can believe. It, it shocks me every time it happens. Um, and people will often do that and they'll repeat back what I say. And you know, lots of times I don't even understand that things that I'm saying are any different than what everybody else is saying. A good example of that. I've probably told you this before. I was at the Key West Literary Seminar, and they were having a big dinner. And we were eating, and there was a a thing of butter down the table, you know, a dish. And I said, can somebody pass the butter, please? Well, the whole table erupted in laughter. And I didn't, I had no idea. And and I said, what is it the way I say it? Uh, what, What did I say? And they said, everything. Like, you use a big, long A when you say pat. They said, you said pass you know and they elongate it and overdo it and then they say and then you say butter and you know to, and i think did they really hear it that way where there's this big dip in butter and they hear if i just say pass the butter they hear pass you know i mean it just doesn't even compute for me but i mean the whole table laughed in unison so i guess <laughs> i guess it did you know but the fact that they felt so free to just openly laugh, I just think tells you something about American culture and the way that people think about a rural accent. Well, and and it's disappointing to me when people who whose vocation centers around language uses it as yeah. a weapon against other people or they use yeah. it to bully other people. And they may not realize it's what they're doing, but it is. It's it happens all the time in the literary world and the academic world. And frankly, I think it's because both of those worlds are largely populated by, I think there are fewer working class people, people of working class origins in the world of academia and the literary world. I'm always shocked by how money the literary world is, how most writers were raised with, you know, with money. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. You know, I'm just saying it's a different way of thinking about things like that. Well, we're getting a lot of comments about how empowering it is to hear that that we're saying it's okay and that they should embrace, you know, that people should um, embrace the way that they speak. So let's talk just a little bit about your writing. And you, you talked about a book coming out soon. What I know you've always got your hand in a lot of different projects. What are you excited about right now? 
Yeah, I did finish a novel that'll be out in fall 22, and we're revising that right now. I'm working with my editor on it. So that's sort of where my whole mind is right now. It's really different for me because it's set in Ireland. And I I thought a lot about language, you know, language differences when I was writing this book. And mm -hmm. um, one of my best friends is married to an Irish woman. And I have taught in Ireland several times and have lots of Irish friends. So they've been, you know, incredibly helpful to me on that. What have it's, you learned about language since you've been going to Ireland? I mean, ha what connections have you made? Well, that's one thing I was about to say is <clears throat> it surprised me how often I heard things in Ireland that I heard in my own home that I don't hear in the rest of America. And so it made me real aware of how so many of those, so much of that has uh, been preserved. For instance, now this isn't all of Appalachia, but where I'm from, we use ye pretty often. And it's a real instinctual thing. Like, I can't tell you that I know when to use, when to use ye versus you in a sentence, but I do it differently. Like I would say, well, I'll see you. I'll see you later. But I wouldn't say, I love ye. But I would say, I love yins. You know, and so it's just like all instinct. But the first thing I noticed when I went to Ireland, I went to a restaurant and um, walked through the door. And the hostess was standing there and she said, how are ye? And I'm like, God, I've just walked into my granny's house, you know, because that's the first thing that would be said. And I heard the word choir. The first time I was in Ireland, which, you know, you don't hear anywhere in America, I don't think, except Appalachia. And that's a word that we just used all the time was was choir. Um, a distortion of the word queer with a whole different connotation, just meaning something odd or different and just things like that. So there are lots of similarities. And, and I learned that they have that Ireland's just like us in that some parts of the country have preserved that and some haven't, you know, the West of Ireland is sort of, I think of as the Appalachia of Ireland because that's where a lot of the preservation happens with the language and uh, the cultural stuff happens more often there. I think people from the West of Ireland sort of, well, I shouldn't say, but I think there's a conflict between the way people speak in the West of Ireland and like a Dublin way of speaking. People get real, upset about stuff like that you know so it's very similar i'm also putting together a short story collection i'm just publishing stories you know in literary magazines and trying to get enough together to get a, a collection published i've been wanting to do that for a while i always have several projects going at once that's how i avoid any kind of writer's block because i always just i always say i always picture it like a stovetop and you know this burner this this pot is boiling over. This one back here is just starting to bubble. This one I haven't turned on yet, but the liquid's in the you know. So they're all at different stages, and I can move around the stovetop when I need to. I think about the same thing, and I've heard Lee Smith say that too. Oh yeah, that she always I'm, has pots boiling. Yeah, yeah. So you you celebrated the twentieth year of your first novel, which is amazing. Because I can remember I met you on a, you were on a book tour. That was the first time I ever met you. And I just remember how quiet you were and, you know, you were signing books and, and that was your first novel. I, I'm curious to know when you think about the trajectory of your writing career, right? Mm -hmm. Over that amount of time, how have things changed? How have you changed as a writer or how have you changed mm -hmm. the way you use language or, or the kinds of things you want to write about? I mean, have you reflected on that with this 20th anniversary? Well, I think one thing is that I hadn't been anywhere when I wrote my first novel. I mean, I was a very provincial person and raised by very provincial people. I mean, we were taught, I was taught to be very suspicious of anybody from not only New York City, but Lexington or Knoxville, <laughs> you know, and just things like that. Very anti-urban, very anti-city. I was sort of led to believe that, you know, the rest, everybody else was these godless people, you know, just things like that. And I think it being thrust out into the world on book tour, the, the house that I'm with is really big on touring. And so, I just went all over the place. Another thing that happened to me on my first book tour is that I was paired with Robert Morgan on book tour. And right around the time we went on tour, his book was picked by Oprah. And so we went from having 10 people at our readings to having a thousand people at our readings. 
And so it was a trial by fire. You know, I just had to learn to do it. And luckily, Robert Morgan's just the kindest person in the world and, you know, made sure that that I got questions, too, because they all wanted to just ask him stuff, you know. But I think my worldview has really broadened. And at the same time that that's broadened, it's allowed me to to even think more about where I'm from and to think, in a way, it's made me put it more under a microscope, if that makes sense. To some degree, I was, even though I never left the region until just, I moved out of the region just two years ago. I now live in Lexington, which is at the edge, you know. But I was always an outsider within the culture, just because of the way I thought about things. Just being a writer, uh, being a gay person, uh, being a uh, the the political ideas I had, the religious ideas I had, I was always an outsider. And I think that's good for a writer to be an outsider to some degree, you know. Sorry, I'm answering too long. I, I oh, want everybody... you're not. Everybody's here to hear what you have to say. I had a great question and it just flew out of my mind. What haven't we covered? Oh, Heinemann, I was going to say that not so much a question, but just a, a reflection, you know, Heinemann is, I think, virtual this year, but Heinemann Settlement School has this great workshop, for those of you that don't know, called the Appalachian Writers Workshop, and and that's, and and I know that you speak about your early start and, and going to Heinemann, and it's a place where a fledgling writer can work with, right alongside people you've been reading, and it's just a special, magical place, and I've gone as many years as I could go. You want to talk a little bit about Heinemann? Well, I just, I mean, it was just a life-changing experience for me, and the main reason it was a life-changing experience is because it was, everything I was talking about earlier, it was like a perfect storm for me. It was like everything that I loved came together, because I would go to, you know, other writer gatherings, and people didn't, people just made fun of the way I talked, and they didn't, understand why I wanted soup beans and cornbread. They thought that was like trashy food, you know, and things like that. But then I went to Hyman and people are, they're talking about literature, you know, they're, they're loving books and poetry and, and really interesting kinds of music and thinking about things in this big way. But at the same time, they still use the colloquialisms that I use and they understand the food, food culture and, there's just an understanding where you just feel at home as as a person who feels somewhat as an outsider within the region and as a person who always feels like an outsider out in the world. It, it's a place where you don't feel like that. And plus, like what you're saying, you're just working with writers that are just really great teachers and they have the publishing experience. So you're just sort of getting everything. And also... I don't quite know how to explain it. If those of you who have been to the Appalachian Writers Workshop at Hyman know, but it's a power place. There's something physical about the place too that I can't explain. Some people say that that happens at confluences, and it's at a confluence of, of the creek. And but but mostly it's just the people who are gathered there and the ideas that are being exchanged. And I think that we had Hyman virtually last year and this year. And we were real worried that that spirit wouldn't exist virtually. And of course, it's harder to capture because you're not all together 24 hours a day for six or seven days. But it's still there, that generosity. So anybody who is interested in in writing, period, and especially if you're from the region, I think it's just, I think you must go. You know, it's it's a, a rite of passage. Lee Smith was the one who encouraged me to go for the me first too. time. And that was the best advice I ever got as a writer because it, it really did change yeah. my world. And it's one of the reasons that Talking Appalachian even happened, because if I hadn't met all those people, mm-hmm. I don't think I would have felt encouraged to try that. Somebody mentioned something in chat I wanted to address real quickly. And they were asking about, is, is Appalachian accent always a rural accent? And I wanted to correct myself and say that, no, I mean, there are urban areas in Appalachia. I mean, Knoxville, Asheville, Charleston, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Wheeling, Huntington. You know, I mean, there are several. So, But I think that when we think about an Appalachian accent and people aren't familiar with the region, they are always thinking that people are rural. People all over the country have said things to me like, there are no cities in Appalachia. There are no black people in Appalachia. There are no gay people in Appalachia. You know, there are no... Uh, everybody in Appalachia is uh, uh, white, straight, 
Christian, you know, et cetera. And this idea, I mean, yeah, we don't have as much diversity maybe as the rest of the country, but we do have diversity. Not only diversity in different kinds of people, but in different ways of being. Right. And and I think that's one of the great things about the Appalachian Studies Association Conference is is mm. I think that's a that's a great place if someone wants to understand more about diversity and, yes. and I think that they're doing a great job of ensuring that that message is there uh, Mm -hmm. about the complexity of the region. I wish we had so many hours just to keep talking. I wish we were on the front porch (laughs) at Hahnemann in a rocking chair. Just keep going because this is so much fun. We've had over 100 people join us, and I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of the questions that we had, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you all. I hope we can have you back on in the near future. And thank you, Silas. Thank y'all. I sure enjoyed being here. I always enjoy talking to you, Amy. So see y'all soon. Thanks. Hello, Southern Salon family. If you'd like to support the podcast and the work that we're doing, particularly with the Talking Appalachian series, you can go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Southern Salon Podcast. We have the link in the show notes. We would really appreciate any help that you can give us in continuing to share this important work. Thank you so much for listening. Today is a great day to start your own podcast. Whether you're looking for a new marketing channel, have a message you want to share with the world, or just think it would be fun to have your own talk show, podcasting is an easy, inexpensive, and fun way to expand your reach online. Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. All you need is a microphone, your recording device, and a quiet space. Your show can be online and listed in all the major podcast directories like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more within minutes of finishing your recording. If you use the link in our show notes, you'll get a $20 Amazon gift card just for signing up for a paid plan and you'll support our podcast. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners and the team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. We can't wait to hear what you have to say.